Financial issues for some Detroit school board candidates. How will pre-election polling impact the presidential race? Obamacare premiums on the rise for next year. And the Pistons, Detroit, the Palace, and L. Brooks Patterson. What do they all have in common? Nolan and Stephen are here to put it all in perspective for you, so stay right put. My week starts right now. Business Leaders from Michigan, a supporter of Detroit Public Television, announces their fifth annual Michigan CEO Summit on November 10th at the Weston Book Cadillac. Learn and share proven ideas and inspiration on business, the digital marketplace, and Michigan's economic growth with top executives. A great lineup of speakers, networking opportunities, and creative inspiration. For more information on the Business Leaders for Michigan CEO Summit, go to businessleadersformichigan.com slash events. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there, and welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. Well, you know, there's a chill in the air, and the countdown to Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas has already started. In just 12 days, America will elect a new president. We're going to talk about the presidential race tonight, plus the rising cost of Obamacare and a rejected offer to sell the Detroit Pistons home in Auburn Hills. But we do start tonight with some eye-opening information coming out of a media investigation into the 63 candidates for the Detroit School Board. A team of reporters from the Detroit Free Press, Bridge Magazine, Fox 2 Detroit, Detroit and WDET FM spent two months looking into the candidates' backgrounds. And here's some of what they found. Twelve candidates filed for bankruptcy. Thirteen candidates lost properties or faced liens for unpaid taxes or mortgages. And 28 candidates were sued for unpaid bills. Now, although money problems don't disqualify a candidate, does it impact a school board leading a financially troubled district? Let's go to our contributors tonight. Nolan Finley, the editorial page editor of the Detroit News, and Stephen Henderson, the editorial page editor of the Detroit Free Press. Guys, it's good to see you, and we're starting with a little something different. We're not starting with the presidential race tonight, yeah. which is a little bit of a palate cleanser for us um, before we actually get, get into that in just a few minutes from now. we just forget it? <laughs> we can't. We can. We're now, we're like, everyone's having the shakes. We're 12 days away, but we will definitely get to that. But I do want to yeah. start off talking about um, this investigation that the Free Press was part of into looking at the backgrounds of all of the candidates for Detroit School Board. Before we get into a little bit of the context about why it matters looking into their background, Stephen, I want you to talk first off about how this actually came together because we don't usually see a lot of uh, journalism organizations, especially you have commercial along with nonprofit right. um, coming together. So where did the ideas start and what were some of those first conversations like about you do this, you do this? So, so my understanding is that ML Elric, who's a reporter at Fox News, right. former free press reporter, was the person who sort of suggested this. and, and the the idea was that all of uh, the journalism outlets in, in Detroit are smaller now and less capable of uh, deploying resources than they have been in the past, uh, and you have this inordinate number of candidates, 60-some people who, whose backgrounds need to be looked into. Why don't we all work together? I think that's pretty much how it started, and uh, I think they sort of just divided up the list among the participants and, and, you know, looked into the things that they all agreed to look into. Interesting, Nolan, that, you know, people are still turned to, I mean, us at public television, they turn to the newspapers as well, they, they turn to other television stations to try to get some of their background information on candidates, not just looking at school board candidates, but the, is that still the role that I think media plays in the landscape in terms of, of vetting this for people? Well, it ought to be, and as Steve said, we're, we're shrinking, so we've got to be creative newspapers all over Michigan this week went through another major cut down in staff uh, bare bones staff were trimmed even tighter and I think you know it's somewhat easier in this market to muster the resources to do something like that but these out, out state papers who have had to trim yet again tougher for them I think it's also interesting, too, because it brings up the entire debate of paying for content as well, and no one really yeah. seems to want to pay for content that they can find online. Well, I think people have gotten accustomed to the idea that it's free. I mean, and that's our fault for having gone online and not asked people to contribute something. It's really hard to, to after you've given away something for free, it's really hard to come back and say, well, now you're going yeah, to have yeah. to pay for this. I'm not sure that's the model going forward either. I think uh, asking the readers to pay is different than trying to find, I mean, for 200 years in this country, it wasn't that readers paid for content, it was that advertisers did. Uh, they pay the freight for 
the, the, the newsrooms and the distribu distribution and delivery and things like that. Um, we need another model like that. And yeah, I think there are some ideas emerging. Uh, we're seeing some promising things in some places, but there's nothing yet that's an answer for everybody to use to sort of stop the, the financial side. A and at the same time, of course, there's more readership <coughs> of these publications than there ever has been when you add up print, digital, now mobile, uh, people reading uh, newspapers on their phones. Uh, th there are more people demanding the content it's just that the con the financial support for it, which was never from readers, is smaller. And it's now 25 years we've been looking for the answer, and the answer hasn't come. And it's you're starting to see, well, you have been seeing the consequences, and it's now starting to get to a, a critical stage. Newspapers have a watchdog role to play in their communities, and you need both a critical mass of readers and an adequate staff of watchdogs to play that role. And so... The, you know, the answer has to come soon because some of these newspapers aren't going to some people yeah. survive. And, and I think it's going to be interesting too uh, that we can start to see some more of these cooperatives. I, mean, I know that you know Detroit Public Television were part of the Detroit Journalism Cooperative, sure. which was different from the group that did this investigation. But let's jump to um, some of the results that we saw now here. Why does it make a difference that some of these candidates have in their background financial issues? Well, that's for the voters to decide, I think. I mean, uh, the idea here uh, was to get the information out to voters so that it's available to them and they can look at it and decide uh, which which bits of information matter the most. Uh, you know, as a Detroiter and, and uh, as a voter, you know, I may look at that differently than somebody else. I mean, I may say, well, you know, lots of Detroiters have financial issues and there's a place where hardship is pretty common. Uh, am I going to hold that against somebody who wants to be on the school board? Or I might look at it and say, you know, finance is one of the, the, the key issues in, uh, in the school district and one of the things that we need the school board to be more uh, vigilant about. So I don't think uh, somebody who's had financial problems in, in their background uh, should be on the board. I mean, I think those are decisions that now voters are going to be able to make because they actually have the information. Uh, to make the, the the choice on. So they have the information, Nolan. Should it make a difference? Well, this is, I think, the most critical election on the ballot, and, and certainly in Detroit, but perhaps all of Michigan. Uh, this school reform and this sort of grand plan that was put together this year won't work without a competent school board. And we've had school board members in Detroit who couldn't pass, who couldn't read, who uh, were uh, accused of domestic violence, who you know, did really disgusting, perverted things in, in with their staff, and you know, it's it's been a mess. It, it, it's critical to get a very, very committed and a very talented school board. And <clears throat> with 63 names, that's a big job for Detroiters. I'm really disappointed that the mayor hasn't engaged and that the business community haven't engaged in this in terms of supporting qualified, competent candidates. There's been very little support for for the various slates who show some promise. All right, so you're looking for spe specific slates. So who should be coming forward and saying, you know what, you need to back these people? Or I, I, I would like to see the mayor play a bigger role, and I'm not sure what explains his absence in this in this conversation. I think the business community, I think it's important that the unions uh, have a voice in this. I mean, unions are a huge part of uh, the way schools operate, uh, protecting teachers, protecting uh, classrooms, which protects kids. Uh, I, I, I think they should be saying, and I think some of them are saying, who they, they want to be. I mean, this is, this is the entire community's responsibility to make sure that the school board uh, is stocked with people who know what they're doing, who are committed to, to, to the city and to the kids, uh, and are going to make decent decisions. And yet it's been a very quiet race. It has been pretty yeah. quiet. Um, at, at the same time, I'll say I, I attended a forum by Citizen Detroit last week uh, with school board candidates and citizens mm -hmm. sort of interacting for about three hours. What was that? What was the format of it? Uh, they had uh, citizens sitting at tables, and uh, the candidates sort of round robined the tables. Spent five minutes each talking to to the different groups. Um, so you had about 22, 23, maybe 26 candidates show up for that. Uh, I, I was really impressed by the range of experience and ability, by the, 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 the keen interest. There are a lot of, you know, Nolan's right, we've had a lot of trouble with school boards in the past mm -hmm. year for a long time. I felt like, uh, I felt like the people I met at this forum uh, were universally 
a, a higher caliber of candidate than we have historically seen in Detroit. Uh, that doesn't mean that all of them are flawless. It doesn't mean that there aren't, aren't things about individuals in that group that, that might say, that might give you a reason to say hey, they shouldn't be on the board. Mm -hmm. uh, but overall, it, it felt to me like a very strong pool to choose from. If you have 26, yeah, I would imagine there's probably more uh, who, who just didn't show up at that, who also fall into that category. It may be hard to winnow it down to seven for some votes. Yeah, I think it's interesting, too, that people can also be educated as to what the school board is actually, what the role is that they're actually going to be playing now in this, in, in this new iteration of the Detroit schools. Yeah, I mean, they're going, they're going to be it. They're going to be the decision maker. I think there is a, a financial review board in place, but in terms of the curriculum decision, the, the operating decisions, um, the, the ability to shape a quality school district, that's going to rest on the school board. And if they don't get it right, I don't, I don't think there's another chance coming. All right, we'll be watching that. You know, turning now to the presidential race, based on early voting results and polling, the nation remains deeply divided on whether Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton should become our next commander in chief. But many wonder if the polling is a reliable predictor of a race outcome and whether early voting results will impact turnout on election day. You know, I, I swear, <laughs> the news cycle on this thing, I think I said at the beginning of the show, I'm beginning to get the jitters. You know, every time you turn on you know, cable news and you're watching and, and all the changes and the new polls that are coming out and um, some polls are putting them closer and then some are, you know, stretching them farther away. Um, Nolan, I, I just want to get your handle on everything that's happened kind of in the last week. Catch me up on what you're what you're thinking from. Well, I mean, you see it's all over the place. There's a, yeah. and It suggests there's a volatility in this race, that it's not settled. I think you all had a poll out this morning, didn't you, Steve, that... Um, it was 4134 Clinton in Michigan. How much undecided is that? It's 20 some percent undecided. That is huge at this stage of the game. And I wonder how much of that undecided vote are, are people who just aren't going to vote for either sure. candidate. Well, they'll show up, but they're just going to skip the presidential piece well, of the ballot. Well, me, There's so many you, variables at work. Let me ask you work. this. Is there, is there a possibility that the people say that they're undecided are people who don't publicly want to say that they're going to vote for Donald Trump? I think there's a little Is there a little, little phenomenon of that? I think there's a lot that. of that. I mean, you also had, so, I mean, you have this phenomenon in lots of uh, elections here where people don't want to be honest with pollsters. Right. 2008, uh, there was fear that people were saying, I'll, I'll vote for Barack Obama uh, because they sort of felt like that was the right thing to say, mm. and in fact that that they weren't going uh, they weren't going to do it. His numbers turned out to be uh, pretty close to what people predicted. I mean, I think the polls have you can't look at one poll, you can't look at one poll at a certain time. You got to look at the you know the averages over time, and I think they they tend to come pretty close to what's going to happen on election day. I mean, there we're, there are much more sophisticated ways of analyzing poll numbers now that tell us uh, what, what voter behavior is really going to be like. Uh, what, what Nate Silver does, for instance, at 538.com, which is build a model that, that polling is a part of and the aggregate polling is a part of, I think is a really great tool for people to be able to see what voter behavior is going to look like. Does that influence the way people are voting now at all because we have all this early voting going on. I don't think country. so. I don't think people walk in there and say I'm going to pick the winner. You know, I'm going to pick who I think is going to win. That. I think people still vote for the candidate they choose. I've never seen the polls so volatile though. I've never woke up and seen one poll at 2% and one at 11% in terms of the gap. I don't know what's going on out there. You know, a lot of it has to do with how it's weighted, these pollsters. It is a science, but, you know, there's a lot goes into it. You, you, take, well, you, you take a call list and you assume an <clears throat> X amount of Republicans, an X amount of Democrats. Uh, you know, you try to anticipate the turnout. That's a hard thing to do today when there's so many independents. Independents now the largest group, and people are moving between the three groups. Um, you know, I talk, I've got three adult kids, and one's a Republican, one's a Democrat, one's an independent. Wow, can I sit at your table for Thanksgiving <laughs> yeah. this year? And, you know, well, I, I, I asked them over the weekend, you know, how are you voting? And, you know, one was voting for Jill Stein, one was voting for Gary Johnson, and one said she was going to skip the ballot, the presidential <laughs> ballot altogether. And I thought, that, if that's typical, this is going to be a very unpredictable election night.
I'm surprised that you even had that conversation because we've had to ban politics in our family. I was going to say we've a lot had of people to, We've not had to ban. We, we will not. We won't talk about it when we all get together. Um, yeah, and even people, among friends, we've yeah. we've had to say, you awful? know what, this is a this is a politics free dinner tonight. Yeah. Uh, seriously. I mean, so people are tired of the fight. I mean, this this is a pretty bitter campaign with two rarely uh, sort of extreme choices uh, on the ballot. I mean, people also need to sort of keep their heads though. Uh, even the poll today, the free press poll today, shows it narrowing to seven. Okay, seven's not narrow though, right? Seven is a is a very very wide gap yeah. to close mm -hmm. in ten days, uh, for sure. So but I mean, that I'm not number, sure how volatile but, it will be. But and, that undecided number is so large. It, it is. And if you but have been there the whole time, if you have the leading candidate still barely above forty percent, that's I mean, yeah. But usually by this time somebody's. You know, they're both candidates are into deep into the 40s. Yeah, and, they should be. And, you know, you still have what's what the interesting thing to me in that poll is that you still have Hillary Clinton about where she was. Yeah. She hasn't picked up votes. Yeah. Donald Trump he has lost goes. votes. Yeah. So and the again, question is, will those votes come place. back so, to him? But where also will they go? the gap, the gap itself matters less than the advantage. So if Hillary Clinton wins Michigan by one vote, uh, she gets she the, gets the and I think the electoral total for her is going to be very much, much higher I'd agree. than the popular, the popular. gap yeah. will yeah. be because of because of these and sort of and so that's what makes these key state polls very important yeah. and they've been all over the place right. too. I mean, Florida has been been back and forth. Other thing I would watch is you know she's raised a tremendous amount of money. Um, you know, for for someone who has decried money in politics, she's still got a huge war chest sitting there and. She's going to apply the all of it, the biggest part of it, to get out the vote. Sure. They've got a tremendous get out the vote machine. Yeah. Donald Trump, having sort of banished the Republican establishment, doesn't have the same a election day apparatus, yeah. and that is very important in, uh, when in you, winning these elections. When you look at these pictures of early voting in states like North Carolina, mm -hmm. states with very heavy African American populations, you look at those lines, you look at the the faces in those lines. Uh, that that get out the vote operator you're talking about is very much already at work. Democrats are already sure. sending out emails every day yeah. to their the people they believe are, are their supporters. Mm -hmm. Have you voted yet? Have you voted yet? Have yep. you voted yet? And well, and, and they're that, uh, that's and, and important. they're also talking about don't don't be complacent. Don't think a seven point seven percentage right, lead, nine percentage lead, you still have to show up and vote. You know, but one thing has been. Um, that's been in, in, in the news very much in the last week or so and has really t been very political is uh, the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. As open enrollment for 2017 approaches, the cost of health care premiums have risen by an average of 25 percent. And in an effort to prevent sticker shock, the Obama administration says the subsidies that offset the cost will also increase. However, critics point out that taxpayers will foot the bill. I think it was interesting because this has become a political rallying cry for Donald Trump. And I think that can, he can take credit for some of the uptick in support and also Republicans saying, hey, this is something that we can hang on to um, and we can use uh, in the political arena. But I want to take a look at it in terms of, um, you know, Shirley, in, in, in terms of policy and why this is happening now in terms of what can we do to change this? Because both candidates say it has to change. So whoever is going to be in the White House, they're going to be in charge of, of trying to change well, it. I'm so, Nolan, when we say when we say that the rates go up and you see in some states it's astronomical in yeah. some states they've, it's actually gone down. Does that mean that the Affordable Care Act, that Obamacare is, is failing? Well, it's not affordable. I mean, the, the rates are going up nationwide 25 percent next year, and it's hard to mitigate that when you, you don't have the ability to write unlimited subsidies. And, you know, I think where it's going to play out, of course, is, is in the congressional races. I think people are going to go very angry, and, and if these Congress people are talking about Obamacare and fixing Obamacare, I think that's going to resonate with voters. But we've got to move it out of the political realm. Right now, and, and since its passage, the Democrats have been, you know, extraordinarily defensive of it. Of it. They see no flaws in it because to admit that's there's true. flaws, to admit unfair. there's flaws is to admit they got it wrong. The Republicans has gone to white. It's flawed. It, he has proposed it's his no, bill. He's proposed no fixes. And, you know, Republicans have been all about let's scrap it. They, they've got to find some middle place where they can figure out what's driving up these costs. From the beginning, Obamacare should have focused on cost rather than access. You control cost, you increase access, and instead they've allowed these costs to just get out of control. So what's the, mid so what's the middle place? Well, so, so first of all, let's talk about what's actually going on. This is the market side of health care reform that's out of control, right? It's not the government side. 
the, the government side where we are signing more people up for insurance, the 20 million people who have insurance now who didn't before, uh, that part of it is working the way it was supposed to. The markets that we created, these exchanges, uh, attracted uh, high-risk people into the pools and not uh, the low-risk people, and they attracted a, you know, a fraction of the number that the government uh, uh, predicted. They had predicted 22 million people would be on the exchanges by now. Now it's 10. Uh, this is the way markets work. And, and well, early markets, there's hold, nothing on, market hold on, hold on. This. It's absolutely yeah. a market. I mean, this is the exchange. This is the, this is the Republican end of the idea is the that, that is not working. Okay. And, and so what you've got to do, first of all, you've got to be patient with new markets. Uh, there are lots of fluctuations early in markets like this. You also have to get more people into those, the only way those exchanges so work is if they have a if mix. If you have of, a mix of people uh, of healthy people. and not yeah. so and not so much, so then what is that? Is that a higher penalty for those who don't come on board? There are a number of different ways you can you can talk about trying to do that. You can also try to uh, adjust other parts of the law to try to maybe uh, suck up some of the. The, the, the people who are not uh, who are not on the exchanges. There are a lot of different ways you can think about trying to address that. The problem has been that the Republican answer has been just no. I mean, uh, they voted 45 times to repeal as opposed to engaging with the president, who has gone over to Congress several times to talk has not with sent leadership. Them a single fix. Gone yeah. over there, to, well, because he goes over there to talk to them, they say, we don't want to talk well, about it. So, is, so you're no, saying, you're saying that politically it before. has been more of a yes or no proposition over, as opposed you, to you, you an say this, You try to assign any of this to Republicans. Republicans had no input on this. this because they didn't want it. This was an entirely Democratic because proposal. They didn't and want there's to also participate. nothing market about this. The government Absolutely. has distorted the marketplace here. You have a situation where the, you have the president saying, be patient, it's going to be better, yeah. and people are getting hit with 25 percent price increases. You've got families now. You, you say more people are insured. It's working the way it should. Yeah. You've got perhaps more people totally insured, but yeah. you have a lot more people who can no longer use their insurance or use their medical care right. because they have to make a decision. The cost am I, am I going to go have this test? Am I going to have this this procedure and have to pay four or five thousand? Some plans have fourteen, fifteen thousand dollar sure. deductibles and co-pays. It's it, their insurance is useless to more people than Okay, than so ever I think before. I think this, what's happening at this table. Hang on, Nolan. Nation. I think what's happening at this table right now is, is illustrative of everything that has been going on in Washington right now. Is we're bringing in the the political side of it where there is there seems to be. You can only win if you're Republicans saying we got to get rid of the whole thing right. and, and, so the start, Republican and start answer over was, again. Let's not do it in the first place, and then the answer has been let's repeal it. They have they have put it on the table. Do you you've start with Hil what's there? You've got Hillary and, Clinton and on the campaign it, trail saying, totally. you know, we make a few tweaks. This thing's going to work. This is not going to work. It needs a major overhaul. And before you can get where there, you have, have the, you have to have the president. You have to have the president. You have to have the Democrats in Congress saying we agree it needs a major overhaul, and they won't is get there. Is it an there. overhaul or a start Ooh. from scratch? Hang on. Is it an overhaul I mean, or is it a start from scratch? You can't start from scratch. You've sure. already ruined the market. So, you know, you can't ask these insurance companies to go back and forget everything so this idea, they've done and this billions of the, um, that they've spent. You need to address the cost aspect of this. So the first thing you need to do is try to figure out what is drawing, driving up these these. Uh, medical costs and attack the costs very, very aggressively. Okay. So Steven, then you can number start one, bringing down the number cost. Number one, the insurance. idea that the president. So this is like a fundamental misunderstanding of the way the government works. The, the president does not propose bills. The president does not propose legislation. The Congress does. Who's in charge of the Congress? Who's been in charge of the Congress since 2010? Republicans. They have the minority plays a role, hold on, Steve. Hold they on. have not. Hold on. The Republicans you, have not proposed a single change to Obamacare other than to they, try to repeal it. absolutely has. That's not true. Paul what, Ryan's what bills, got a complete plan what bills, out what there. What bills have they passed in what both bill chambers the and sent to the president? What bill would the president sign? Well, what bill would the president sign? What bill, what bill could you get through the Senate? Let's talk about it and what bill could you get? The time to have gone over there and talked to it would have been before it passed. But he did. He wrote but he did. He spent, he, he spent, he spent he a year talking Republicans with Republicans and Democrats. Not a single Republican amendment was was adopted. Because their goal was and this is order. what is going to be on the agenda in January. Well, I, I mean, think, the, I, I think so. I, I mean, the it, truth here is, you've got uh, you, you're getting you're going to get to a point where the middle class has absolutely no health care protection and are spending the bulk of their okay. their income, their disposable income, 
on health All right. insurance. We are going to have to. Uh, we're going to have to leave that one there. Um, I want to do the, the parting shot that Elbrooks Patterson does not want to buy the palace. They, uh, the Oakland <laughs> County turned. They turned it down. Good deal, bad deal, Nolan. Well, I mean, Oakland <laughs> County knows what what. Uh, Owning stadiums and arenas like they got stuck you're, with the. You ever seen a silver dome lately? They got stuck with the silver dome. I don't they think. They sold it. So they're getting getting, getting, getting close to uh, getting dollars. close for the Pistons uh, to come downtown. Tom Gordon. That's what everybody says. Some, uh, yeah. I am going to be one of the first dealing. people buying Season tickets, tickets to right. yeah. I'll buy a package. Will you be courtside? I don't think I can afford. Oh yeah. That. You'll be right on the court. Like You'll that, always be on TV when they when they go by. It'll be Steven. Buy a couple tickets. You can take us. That's right. You guys can go. That would be great. I want to turn on the Pistons game and see both of you sitting courtside next to each other. <laughs> agreeing on something for once. <laughs> That's going to do it for my week. Make sure you catch up with us on myweek.org. Follow us Twitter and Facebook. We are there. I'm Christy McDonald. For all of us at Detroit Public TV, thanks for watching. We will see you next time. Take care. <laughs>